yeah, let's take a look. So, uh, yeah, the first part, muh, it kind of looks like me, right? But let's say it, muh. So let's start with muh. Uh, Fibbesheth. <laughs> so that P-H is like a f, like Philadelphia, muh, f, and then bosheth. So uh, let's try, I'll say it one more time, and you guys chime in. So, muh, fibbesheth. Yeah, isn't that crazy? I wonder what his middle name is. You know, that's the real thing when he's in trouble. <laughs> Would hate to imagine that one. So, yes. So, Mephibosheth. So, the important thing is Jonathan's son. So, to appreciate this story, we have to go back in time. 1 Samuel chapters 20 through 24, some terrain we covered last summer, profiled this incredible relationship that David, who was a humble shepherd boy back then, had with Jonathan, who was the son of the current king, Saul. For whatever reason, these two had chemistry. It's extraordinary. So read through those chapters and you'll see how they looked out for each other, how they truly cared for one another, and they made a covenant with each other. So as people who read the Bible um, and are people of faith, when we see the word covenant, lights should go on, fireworks should go off in our heads. Covenant. Covenant is a really super big deal in the Bible. So when we see that word, we should stop and say, ooh, do obeisance. That was a funny word too in the text. When we see the word covenant and think, okay, this is a big deal. So there's covenant in the Old Testament, covenant in the New Testament, and there's covenant that is part of our theology as Reformed um, believers and Presbyterians covenant. Covenant originates with God, that God makes a covenant with humans. God makes a promise to be for humans, to look out for humans. So it starts with a, a promise from God, but here in this story, two humans are making a covenant between them to look out for each other um, in life and in death, a covenant. So uh, it's interesting, a covenant is, it's a promise. So it goes unfulfilled and, or, you know, it, it has to be stewarded, taken care of, thought about, covenant. So Jonathan and David made a covenant to one another. Then at the end of 1 Samuel, tragically, Jonathan dies, uh, related to battle, along with his father, King Saul. So, sad news for King David. And King David, Jonathan's not around, he could have forgotten about the covenant, but he is troubled. He is still thinking about this covenant he made with Jonathan. And, and King David is depicted as very loyal very faithful and very ethical. That covenant, he really takes it seriously. It's not just lip service. It's not just for when anybody's looking. He's going to follow through on that covenant. And he's a bit stymied about what to do. Well, someone knows about Ziba, a servant from Saul and Jonathan's house. Uh, David does some consulting with Ziba, and Ziba identifies this son of Jonathan, whose name is Mephibosheth. Yes, very good, very good, Mephibosheth. And David says, well, where is he? And he seems to be sort of warehoused in some other part of the region. And so Mephibosheth is brought forward to King David. And David says to him, listen, do not be afraid, because he might have been afraid. Why, why is the king summoning me? 
he might know that his grandfather Saul kind of put a price on David's head. There was some awkwardness there. But David says to Mephibosheth, listen, nothing to fear. I'm looking out for you. I remember your dad. And listen, um, I know times are tough. And you're gonna, your land has been seized. I'm going to restore your land. And I want you to eat at my table every single day. Wow. So, you know, is this just a story of, you know, two friends and I'm looking out for a friend, which is a big deal, generational care, or is there something more going on? If you look at the details that we know about Mephibosheth, it's kind of striking. So Mephibosheth, we imagine maybe it's a young person. How young, we don't know. He was an orphan. He had, you know, connections to King Saul, but his grandpa was sort of, didn't have the best reputation. And um, that grandpa died in battle, along with Mephibosheth's dad, Jonathan. And in a super patriarchal society, Mephibosheth was without patriarchs to look out for him. In addition, in 2 Samuel 4, 4, there's a story told about what happened to Mephibosheth when he was but five years old. When his father, Jonathan, and grandfather died in battle, their household was so alarmed, they quickly uh, scooped everything up and moved and um, tried to figure out what to do. And in that process, the person in charge of Mephibosheth um, dropped him somehow, and it caused some sort of accident where Mephibosheth lost power of his feet and lost mobility. So Mephibosheth not only didn't have family to look out for, him, he was uh, injured. He had a critical injury for the rest of his life. And then we discern that he lost his lands, he lost whatever he had. And then to me, the most telling clue of all, when Mephibosheth appears before King David, he says to David, what are you doing with a dead dog like me. That was how Mephibosheth saw himself. And I was thinking that was how society saw him too. Dead dog. But in David's eyes, Mephibosheth was beloved. Mephibosheth was part of the covenant. Mephibosheth was a part of someone you would, of course, show kindness toward. Very different sets of eyes. And I think the Deuteronomistic editor of these stories wanted us to think about that just a little bit more. You know, our church's theme for the year is kindness. Kindness. So, um, and we're starting to wrap, ramp up our study of kindness. There's a theme team looking at the word and uh, figuring out our next liturgy of kindness and our texts and, you know, practices of kindness. So behind the scenes, we've been doing a little more research about kindness. And for that research, this week, I thought, you know, I'm just going to go to the NRSV, a translation of the Bible we have in our pew, Concordance, which is a big, thick book that lists words of the Bible and where various words are used. And I'm going to look up the word kindness and kind and see where's the word used, how often is it used, and in what context is it used. And guess where the word kindness has the highest density of use? Random. The story today blew my mind. So in our study of First and Second Samuel, I didn't 
select this as a study for us because of kindness, you know, the abundance of the word kindness, particularly in this story. And in studying it, you know, we prepare the studies months in advance to before they get rolled out. You know, I was struck by a, a thread of, there seems to be a, a sense of moral excellence in these stories. So that's kind of the overall theme we've been working with across the summer and now as we're wrapping it up this fall. So our, our theme has been moral excellence in messy times. So sometimes you start with a theme and then you do this big, long Bible study and you kind of figure out, does the theme really fit? How's it doing? Man, does that theme fit still here in the depths of 2 Samuel 9? It's like that deuteronomistic editor, the editor that put the stories together and offered a little interpretation and spin and commentary for how they're told, really still wants us to think about moral and ethical excellence in the middle of a mess. Now, sometimes recently, we have quibbled with the Deuteronomistic moral code. And, you know, we have to think about, well, okay, what's the context and what, what was the... Um, what was the thinking there? And, you know, look, last week we talked a lot more about that uh, concerning how they did warfare and how they saw enemies. But today, it's another example of what they saw as excellent. And um, um, just superlative ethics when someone could turn away. Because, you know, David was a king. There wasn't anybody around to keep him in line. Who knew about the covenant? But David did so. And David didn't just keep covenant. He kept a covenant of kindness. Kindness, kindness, kindness. Three times in this very rich text. You know, when I first looked at this story, and then as I prepared for this week, I thought, oh, it's just a sweet little text, you know. No one gets killed. Just kidding. Some of these stories are pretty gruesome. Um, what a sweet little text. And now, as I've studied it more, I think, oh, this text is such a container for holiness and the big will and intention of God. I mean to talk about covenant and to talk about kindness in the same story is pretty profound. Let's dig in just a little bit more about kindness. Kindness for us sometimes is like, just be nice, just be nice, be nice. Kindness in the Bible is so much more if you dig into that Hebrew word uh, in 1st, 2nd Samuel, you find the Hebrew word hesed. H-E-S-E-D, sometimes in English, or C-H-E-S-E-D, chesed. Hesed is seen as the central quality of God in the Old Testament. God is chesed. And the word has said all across the Old Testament is translated in various ways. And here it's translated as kindness. Other places it's translated as steadfast love. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's faithful love, God's loyal love. It's a central attribute of God. God is has said, God is kind. God is love. And God doesn't just hang out chilling on God mountain with it. God makes a covenant to share that love with all people. And the Bible is a record of how God connects with people and how people are containers for God's has said. And, uh, and then it's pumped into us, and then we 
have the calling, have the vocation of pumping it out toward other people. So this story is a container of what God intends across all time and space for all people to be part of a covenant of kindness. That is the whole biblical narrative starts with God. God connected with Abram, later Abraham, Moses, other prophets. God connected with Jesus, who lifted up a cup at the communion table and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Covenant, covenant, covenant. Covenant of kindness. That is the moral standard. That is the narrative of the Bible. And it's not quite complete. We are keepers of the covenant. That's why we're called into church. It's why we have baptism. It's why we're fed by the communion table, why we gather. It's to remind ourselves of the big story of God's covenant to love everybody. God's keeping up God's end of the covenant, but the human end Sometimes we fall down on. It's like, what's going on in, in our society today? I was thinking there's such a moral poverty that we live in. It's so the opposite of keeping a covenant of kindness. What happened? What's going on? Maybe we just didn't know what the narrative was. And some narratives of the Bible make the Bible sound like it's more about looking backward and maybe you should be wearing a head covering. That's not our narrative. As Presbyterians, we take the stories of the Bible and we see a sweeping narrative of everybody at a table, including dead dogs. Everybody headed toward God's table welcome. Everybody's there. Everybody fed. Everybody restored. That's the vision that we are headed toward. And maybe we don't know about who God really is, and we hear other narratives from even other churches that are just so small about God, or trying to contain God, or separate God from the people that God loves, how terrible, and what an opportunity we have as a church to point to the true nature of God, the bigger arc of the story of God, the fuller narrative. We are looking toward what God intends for all humanity. One big table, lots of food, belonging, everybody's there. That's what we visualize. And maybe when we have that vision in our head, it helps our actions. So it's not just lip service. It's not just when someone else is looking. We have a deep commitment that is beyond our lives. We are stewards of a covenant across all time and space God has called us into to look out for everybody, independent of what society says. We're looking out for everybody. We see, oh my gosh, there's my family member. There's my coworker. There's the person that's going to sit with me at the table. Who can be there? This covenant goes beyond one person. This covenant goes beyond one mean person, what they might say. This covenant goes beyond incidences in society. It goes beyond bad theology. It's so beyond us, and yet we are within this covenant. You are loved by a kind God who calls you, calls dead dogs like me to a table to experience love. And we have within us this channel, this <coughs> make me a channel of your peace. Make me a channel of your kindness because we are part of this amazing covenant. God needs us more than ever right now to be channels of kindness. So let's keep in mind where we're headed. This whole kindness project, there's more to come. 
I'm glad to be on this journey with you. To God be the glory. Amen.